Amen. Father, we acknowledge that you are here. Lord, we love your presence, the movings of your spirit, the apprehending, Lord, of our lives for your purpose, for your glory. We love, Lord, the gathering of your church, your body, that functioning, moving, stirring of the Spirit in our midst, bringing us together into unity. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And we ask, Lord, in the time that we have this morning, that there might be that settling, that sense of direction, purpose, Lord, that we might know who we are, what we're to do, and where we are going. Help us to understand, to find our place, our part, and to become, Lord, that which you would have us to be. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Basically, what I said yesterday, I can say it in about one or two sentences. (laughs) all that I said yesterday, and it's simply this, that the emphasis is moving from the pulpit to the body. It's the body that's being built up, equipped. There's a fresh anointing, a fresh stirring, a fresh moving coming within the body. The head is going to be joined, not to the fivefold ministry, but to the the body. The fivefold ministry is to bring the body to the place where the body can be joined to the head. Then the ministry will disappear into the body. Glory. Hallelujah. And so the spotlight is on the body, not on the pulpit. And for too long we've been looking for these dynamic speakers that will come and do their thing and we sit back and watch and applaud and say, wasn't that wonderful? Well, that day's over. So... There's a moving within the body. Almost always, uh, well, I'll get, without using scripture, because I'd want to use a lot of time on this. Remember the multitude, the 5,000 men, besides women and children that came, and Jesus told the disciples to feed them? And immediately they checked their resources, and they had the equivalent of $16 in our money. And there was, there was a little fellow there that had five loaves of bread and two small fish. 5,000 men besides women and children. $16. Well, even if you could buy bread for a dollar loaf, that, that's not going to... So the first thing they did was begin to explain to the Lord that they really didn't have the ability, the resources. Which is exactly what we do when the Lord asks us to do something. We begin to explain to the Lord that we're not qualified. You're, isn't that right? They all, immediately, that's our response. Lord, we can't, we're really not qualified. Well, if we were qualified, the Lord would not want to use us because then we would have the ability and we would get the glory. So the Lord is choosing those who do not have ability so that he will get the glory. So the fact that you don't have the ability means that you are qualified. <laughs> See, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways your ways. And immediately, we be, when the Lord asks us to do something, immediately we look at ourselves and we say, but I don't have that kind of ability. I don't have the personality. I don't have the charisma. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> well, the answer that comes back from the Lord is simply this. He, al- he, he already knew that before he asked you to do it. <laughs> He, he, he already knows. So, the, so all that he asked of the disciples was once they explained all the reasons why they couldn't and the little bit that they had, all he said was, well, just take what you have and give it to me. That's all I want. I want your limitation placed in my hand that it can become an unlimited supply. So we take our limitation, put it in his hand. <clears throat> once in a while... I get some place where when I speak, somebody says, oh, that was wonderful. You really have something. You're this or that. You know, well, I have a... See, well, I say, yeah, that's right. Well, then then I'm in real trouble. (laughs) See? But I have a cure for that. 
because I used to rebuke them and beat around and explain to them, no, none of that's true. And, you know, just to go through a whole ritual. But I've got a correction now that works. So I don't have to, I just say thank you. And I have no trouble at all. Remember the marriage at Cana? Six water pots, that's us. The, 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 the servants were told to go out and fill them with water. They did not have a faucet. They didn't have time to pump, pull it up from a well. They couldn't, you know, they didn't have an electric pump. They didn't have time. So what they did, in those days, they had these tanks that they would put where buildings or mountain or runoff, where they would collect runoff, water off the roof and all would run into this tank with cistern water. You know, just basically, it's just polluted water. So they filled these six water pots. That's the human. Six is man's number. The six water pots were filled with, with polluted water. And that polluted water was born to the master of the feast. He dipped in. When he drank it, something happened. In between the pot and him, see, in between, it became the very best. So when somebody says, wasn't that wonderful? See, I know who I am. I'm, the, I'm that cistern water. See, the water pot. But somewhere between here and there, something happens. And it becomes the very best. So when somebody says that, I don't have to rebuke them and tell them they shouldn't say that and all this and try to be humble. <laughs> I can just say thank you. Because I know that what happened, I, I know what's here, it's cistern water. But something happened between here and there. There was a transformation. So we can begin to believe the Lord that that which we have, see, because we, especially me, I always look at myself. And that isn't good <laughs> because there's nothing there. But between here and there, something happens. I'll never forget this. I've, some of you that have been around have, have heard me say this. A pastor, an elderly man in Connecticut, asked me once to come, and I had an appointment. People were coming a long distance, and I couldn't break the appointment. He wanted me to go to a prayer breakfast the next day, and I said, I can't, and he pled with me. And I said, well, I could leave after the appointment, but I'd get there in the middle of the night. Well, I arrived. I'd been there before, and <clears throat> I got there actually at 5 o'clock in the morning. I drove all night, and it was agony to stay awake. I got there at 5 o'clock in the morning. He heard me come in because I knew I slipped in. He said, just come in and go to bed when you get here. And He heard me and he said, I hate to tell you, we have to leave at 6. <laughs> so, and you know, and after, after struggling like that, you don't sleep because you're still driving. And <clears throat> so in that meeting, I was so tired. I couldn't hardly think. At the end of the meeting, two ladies came and said, we're, we understand you're a teacher. And I said, yeah. And so they said, well, we're, we're having a Bible study. And the scripture says, Esau have I hated, Jacob have I loved. They said, would you explain why? Well, I've, never heard, I've always heard that God is sovereign and he'll choose whom he will. And if you read the circumstances, the situation, Isaac was old. And he desired some meat. So Esau went out to get meat for his father. Well, that's good because this, if you compare Scripture with Scripture, it's, that's real easy because Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of my father. Esau is out getting meat for his father. And while Esau is getting meat for his father, what's Jacob doing? He's busy deceiving his father. Esau have I hated, Jacob have I loved. Well, that don't, so it don't fit. See, it doesn't fit. And so, <clears throat> if you read the commentary, the commentary says, well, God will choose whom he will. Not because of, but, but see, but there's a reason. Now, I explained to them why. I had never read or heard in my life. I was so tired, I couldn't think. But just as calmly as if I had known all my life from Scripture, I explained exactly why. Then, fortunately, I wrote it down. So... <laughs> Because I've done this other times and didn't and lost it. But I wrote it down. See, it's not what we do in the place of blessing. See, each were seeking the birthright. Jacob went after it through deception. Esau seeking to please his father. He did it right, but he lost out. Because man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the 
So all so ministry then basically is an issue of the heart. It's the attitude. It's not ability. It's the heart. That's 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 primary. So it's what we do in the place of need, of pressure, that determines the action of God. It's how we react in the place of need. It's not our ability. It's it, it, it's not the human, but it's our reaction in the place of need. <clears throat> so. Esau came in extremely hungry, famished, and Jacob was making some stew. And Esau said, please, can I have a bowl of that stew? And Jacob said, if you give me the birthright, you can have it. And Esau said, what good, I have seen people squirm when I've said this, what good is the spiritual, the supernatural? What good is the blessing of God, my flesh? desires, satisfaction. See, I'm hungry. We hunger for all kinds of things. What good is the spiritual, the power of God? Esau said, I'll take the bowl of soup. You can have the birthright. See, he despised the spiritual. This is the very heart of ministry of pleasing the Lord. Here's the very heart of it. That we put the Lord first. <clears throat> that our life, our lifestyle takes on that which will please the Lord, see, that we walk with him. <clears throat> so then, Esau, under pressure, Esau chose the, satisfa the satisfaction of his flesh rather than the presence, the power of God. Now, <clears throat> after he, he wept, but he didn't really repent because later he tried to kill Jacob. And had he really repented, he would not have tried to kill Jacob. Mm -hmm. Jacob fled, and always when you flee from a situation, you find out you end up in one that's worse. Mm -hmm. Because there's a Laban that's out there waiting for you. That's more mm -hmm. deceptive and more cunning than you are. And so God has ways to reduce us. But eventually, Jacob had met the Lord, and he's coming home with two wives and all his possessions. And he found out that he was told that Esau was coming with 400 armed men to meet him. He panicked and began to pray. Then he began to scheme, because he had still had some of that in him. He said, what I'll do, I'll take the lesser wife and a few possessions, and I'll send them out. Then I'll wait. Then I'll send the rest towards Esau. Then I'll watch. If Esau devours the first group, I can take the best and run. <laughs> so that's, that may, that, that's reasonable. <laughs> so <clears throat> the Lord, in a theophany, the Lord Jesus Christ came and began to wrestle with him. At the critical moment, just about the time, this is in, it's in Genesis chapter 32. At the critical time, just when Esau and the first group were about to meet. The Lord said, the Lord said to Jacob, let me go. Now Jacob could have said, Lord, we'll wrestle tomorrow. I'm about to lose everything. I'll meet with you tomorrow, any time but now. Right now, I'm about to lose everything. But rather, Jacob said to the Lord, who knows, I will not let you go, except you bless me. And immediately, the Lord's response was, what's your name? And he said, I'm a deceiver. Because he put the Lord first in the place of pressure, the Lord said, your name will be no more deceiver but Israel, and you will have power with God and with men. There's the heart. There again now, see? ministry. You'll have power with God. Because in the place of pressure where it's easy to be disobedient, to do your own thing, to protect yourself. See, Paul said, ministry works death in me, but life in you. What he means is, see, you have something in God. People will come and they'll feed on you. You feed on the Lord, but they feed on you. They'll, bury, they'll eat the life out of you. And it's costly because you're giving. But that's what ministry is. Now, I want to end up with 
yesterday, I'm going to put this thing together that I shared yesterday. But Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> the Lord begins with us, not with our ability, but with our inability. Because he desires to reveal his power and glory. And if we had the ability, then the reward would be obvious. It would be us. But rather, the Lord uses those that have no ability that he might receive the glory. So then, it's not what I have, it's what I do with what I have that's important. And this is the very heart of ministry. And we'll switch in a couple minutes. But I just want to build this for a foundation. Math, verse 31, Matthew chapter 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. That field, the field is a man, that's you. The field is where you live. The people, the circumstances that you relate to. It's all the circumstances that are in your life that you relate to. And the seed is the word of the kingdom. It's the word that will bring life that you can share. <clears throat> But the Lord doesn't use people with a lot of ability. He uses people with inability, again, that he might receive the glory. Therefore, that which relates to God within the context of your life, my life, it's the least of all seed, which means there, there's so little of God in, in me it takes almost a microscope. See, but it's, but it's not how much I have, it's what I do with what I have that's important. So then, if I will acknowledge that and make room for it, and I'll respond rightly, Esau responded wrongly. See, he chose his own. Jacob chose the Lord, though there was very little of the Lord because immediately the Lord said, what's your name? He said, I'm a deceiver. So there wasn't very much of the Lord there. And he, was very, he had cunningly schemed, you know, he had prayed, but still he had worked so there wasn't much of the Lord there. But he had put the Lord first. See, he had, Lord, I'll not let you go. See, he put the Lord first. That's, that, that's the thing, the field, the response to it. Which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seed. But if I'll be faithful and I'll respond rightly when the, in the, any given opportunity, I'll never forget, this would be about 19... 57. I had been praying. To me, someone that could prophesy or say, thus saith the Lord, or the Lord said, or something, I, I couldn't, I mean, that was be, almost blow my mind. I couldn't conceive of it. I had been praying and asking the Lord for a prophetic anointing. On a Sunday morning, I'm sitting in a little church of 12, 15 people. I've been praying, asking the Lord for, the, for a prophetic gift. The Lord had been moving in the service, and all at once the pastor turned the service away from what the Lord was doing. And I'm sitting there, and all at once my heart started to pound. I got quickened. I knew just enough what I was supposed to say that I knew that I didn't want to say it. <laughs> I knew just that much that I knew that I didn't want to say it. And I, I sat there and wished I had never prayed, I'd never asked. I actually prayed for a hole in the floor that I could drop through it. And I struggled. That seat got hot. I literally began to sweat. But I couldn't bring myself to obey, and I didn't. But that was so strong. That afternoon, I literally went to the pastor's house, knocked on his door, and told him what happened, and apologized, and repented of it, and gave him the word. And then the Lord began to move. See, that grain of mustard seed, it's not how much you have. I know just enough to know because it was, it was corrective, and I didn't want to give it. And, and I had never, never prophesied in my life or, given, or never done anything quite like that. But see, it's what you do with what you have. It's faithfulness, which a man sowed in his field. See, there's, there is an interaction there. Where, where when we begin to pray, we believe that the Lord's going to begin to answer. And that answer will come in simple, practical, unexpected ways. It's the least of all seed, but when it's grown, how does it grow? Well, you pay attention to it. 
you know, you, you nurture it, you water it, you let the sun, the S-O-N, shine on it. You water it with the Holy Spirit. It becomes the greatest amongst herbs. Now, this is interesting. The scripture says herb. That's, an herb is medicinal. But, you get, but there's a certain way you get benefit out of it. You grind it, you pulverize it, <laughs> you boil it. And that's what happens to you in ministry. You get ground, pulverized, <laughs> boiled. You know, you get squeezed because people are interested in what, in what they're going to get out of you. And so, you know, you become an herb. You become medicinal for the benefit of another. That, see, that, see, and you have to accept that if you're going to be used. You have to know that. You get boiled, pulverized, round. You become an herb. Someone told me once, I had a little aloe plant, and they said, that's good if you ever get cut or something, just break a piece off and rub it. Well, one day I cut myself on a piece of paper. So I broke a piece off, and I rubbed it on it, then I tossed it in the wastebasket. And all at once, a word come out of the wastebasket, and it said something like this. You mean that I grew, I gave my life, I brought healing to you, and the thanks I get is that you tossed me in the wastebasket? <laughs> See, but you have to know that. That's, that's ministry. <laughs> See, that's ministry. Now, it's, it becomes the greatest among herbs. That's the result of faithfulness, of being willing to be used, take advantage of, walked on, criticized. See, all those things, you become a herb. You become medicinal for the benefit of another. And you end up getting pulverized, crushed, ground, because they'll squeeze it out of you. Then they'll toss you in the wastebasket. You've got to expect that. Because you know that your relationship is not to them but to the to the Lord it becomes the greatest amongst herbs and becometh it becometh the tree now a tree is not an herb it's a different species if the evolutionists could prove a mutation by mutation, I mean a change from one species to another. They would have a field day. They never have. Because that which is has come by creation. There are progressions or changes within species, but they have never proven a change from one species to another. But here's a change. It's an herb is a plant becomes a tree. That's a mutation. Only God can do that. And what I'm saying is this. Mm. the five ministry I'll give you a verse and then we're going to come back I want to say this through a verse it's Hebrews chapter 5 Hebrews chapter 5 for every I'm going to change it a little bit Hebrews chapter 5 for every minister Taken from among men. See, that's the herb level. The herb. See, it's being faithful where we are. See, this is what I want to say. See, if that herb is faithful, that mutation comes from above. Only God can do that. Mutations don't just happen. There are changes within species, but this is, this is, is, a, is a plant becoming a tree. <clears throat> so, every minister taken from... Uh, from among men is ordained. That word ordained means to be set apart, to be recognized, to be established. Is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices. See, taken from among men, taken from among the herbs, becomes a tree. That he might offer both gifts. See, is ordained, becomes a tree. It's the herb becoming a tree. It's being faithful. I'll give you another one in just a minute. The same line. Well, Psalm 78, verse 70. Psalm. David in the sheepfold. He chose David, for verse 70. See, he chose David also an herb. See, he's faithful where in the sheepfold. That's the herb level. 
See, faithful in where you are, your responsibilities, where there's a faithfulness towards others, being willing to be used, to be used, take advantage of, to become, to give, but being content, being satisfied. He chose David, also his servant, and took him from, this is the herb becoming a tree, from following the ewes, great with young. See, there was a faithfulness on the common level. Down through the years, people have come to me and said, oh, if I could just be in the ministry, I just, I want to be in the ministry. If, if, if I could just get, get an ordination card, then. I, no, 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 it don't work that way. An ordination card does not impart ministry into you. An ordination card is the result of a ministry. And I have said this to I, dozens of people. I have said, when you have a ministry, when you have a group of people that are looking to you, that are, that, 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 are, that, are, that are responding to you, that relate to you, I will come and ordain you in front of them. But until then, you're an herb. <laughs> See? And you function faithfully, allowing people to use you, abuse you, take advantage of you. He chose David, see? The reward comes from him. See, the Lord notices to feed Jacob his people. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart. See, he developed that in the sheepfold, in the practical, in the earthly. I'll give you another one. <laughs> one more. It's Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. <clears throat> Verse 24. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, this is Moses, he knew he was called. He, and he's in the place of his calling. But he's an herb. Still is. Seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was opp oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Verse 25. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. And I've got a little footnote here and it says they still don't. <laughs> See? He supposed his brethren would have understood the calling that rested on his life. Some of you are right there. And you're frustrated because others are not recognizing the calling that you feel you have. And the answer is... Be faithful where you are. See, because promotion comes not from them, from the ones that you're thinking should recognize, but it comes from where? From the Lord. He supposed his brethren. So he fled, literally, from his brethren. And here's what's interesting. He fled. There are those that flee from the brethren today. They say, I'm not going to church. The church is full of hypocrites. Nobody understands. Nobody knows. You know. They're all, kind, you know, on and on. And they backslide, whatever that means. Uh, <clears throat> but what's interesting is this. There was no backsliding. See, he fled. Moses fled. But he's in, he's in the wilderness, and he's keeping the sheep. The sheep, that's the flock. See, Israel, he's called to the sheep of Israel, now he's keeping the sheep of Jethro. He's the priest of Midian. That's not the God's people. But he's, he's called the sheep and he's keeping sheep. He's tending sheep. He's rejected by those to whom he's called and he's, and he's fulfilling the call anyway. I hope you hear that. If you hear that, that'll take you a long way. Because it'll deal with, see, it's the heart, the issue of the heart where you feel you're not understood, accepted, you, you moved out and you were rejected. All the, Lord's do, all the Lord's doing is just dealing with a little bit of pride. That's all. <laughs> just getting you ready. <clears throat> so he's keeping the sheep of Jethro. He's faithful. And at that point, there came an intervention. Moses, Moses, the burning bush. This is, this is a present word. You heard it this morning. The Shekinah. See, that burning bush is Shekinah that's about to be restored. Hallelujah. And Moses stood there, and the first thing the Lord said had to do with the mutation. The herb now is about to become a tree. 
take off your shoes. See, in other words, you know, you can't you can't walk in a, in, in in a desert without shoes. Boy, it's full of stones and rocks and mm -hmm. cactus and on and on and on. You don't walk without shoes. Moses, take off your shoes. In other words, Moses, you've gone as far as you're going in your shoes. Now you're going to walk in my shoes. And he, and, and he put on the Lord's shoes, and together with one set of footprints, they went back to Egypt. Now Pharaoh trembled. See, the herb became a tree. But see, he stayed faithful in the place of intense reduction, of rejection, of misunderstanding, of, of his calling being misunderstood and literally rejected, he was faithful. He's leading sheep. Not the Lord's sheep, but he's leading sheep, and he's leading them towards the mountain of God. Now that's, that's profound. And too often we get turned aside by somebody because what we think we have is not recognized. Well, you stay faithful. Now, Matthew 13, back to Matthew 13, which indeed is what? The least of all seed. It's not what you have, it's your attitude, your heart, the way you handle what you have in relation to the Lord. But when it's grown, it becomes the greatest amongst herbs. The mutation becometh a tree. Moses, take off your shoes. See, there's that, and now there's that. See, every, every, minister taken from taken from among men is ordained for that very thing see a direct intervention of the Lord and it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches a man that I whose ministry I sat under that greatly affected my life Walter Butler had a profound there's nobody alive today that could walk in his shoes he had a profound walk with the Lord and I'm not putting him on a pedestal but he had a profound walk with the Lord. And he always said this, if you've got the goods, people will sense it, they'll smell it. What you have will make room for you. See, you, he, you become a tree. The birds, those that are out there that are hungry, that are seeking, they'll find you if you've got it, if you've got something. They will find you. They'll come and lodge in the branches of your experience your relationship to the Lord. They'll lodge in the branches and they'll find comfort in your relationship to the Lord, in that mutation, that lifting. It's a faithfulness. Our part is to be faithful. <clears throat> Concerning ministry, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now the next point. 1 Corinthians, chapter 12. Verse 31. The Old Testament says, Thou shalt not covet. That's a strong word, covet. The law clearly says, Thou shalt not covet. Verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but what? Covet. covet. Not only covet, but do, covet what? Covet. Intensely covet. In other words, see, thou shalt not covet. What this is taking that very thing and lifting it out of the earthly up to something higher. Esau chose the stomach. Jacob chose the, the higher. I'll, I'll not let you go until you bless me. Covet earnestly the best gift. What is the best gift? It's the one that's needed. The gifts, the ministries, God hath said in the church, we're going to move to that in a minute. God hath said in the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. The fivefold. There are those that go through that mutation and are placed in a, in a place of ministerial responsibility. But their purpose, and we'll get this said before we're finished today, their purpose is to equip the body for the work of ministry. And so, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, these ministries are reflected in the body and are functioning within the body. And I want to come to the apostolic. And we'll do it before we're, before we're done. Concerning ministry, 
you can go after it, you can ask for it, you can desire it intensely and, you, and seek it, and you're encouraged to do it. You want to be an apostle? Go after it. It's going to cost you, <laughs> but that's all right. See, it's all right. Because there's a satisfaction that comes through being used, through meeting needs that you, you'll never find in anything. In 1943... 1942, and it happened in 43. I got a letter from Franklin D. Roosevelt that said, Greetings. <laughs> and I ended up in an infantry camp in South Carolina, 1943. And there was a frustration, and I had like an intense desire to have my own business with an office on Main Street. I mean, it was like a drive, an office on Main Street, my own business. I wandered into a chapel. At one point, because I ended up being a radar repairman, and the mortality rate for radar repairmen in North Africa was 98 percent. So the number, the position being technical, was frozen by the Pentagon. There was no way out. So I came to the conclusion that I had a one-way ticket. I grew up in a modernistic church. I knew nothing of salvation. Didn't even know there was such a thing. But I wandered in a chapel and said, God, if you get me through this war alive, I will go in the ministry. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> but <clears throat> was discharged from the army in the fall of 45, completely forgot, hardly went to church for five years, hardly. 1950, the Lord began to stir me. And finally, the Lord said, I, I'd completely <clears throat> forgotten when I was on my way to Bible school, it came back in like a vision that I had made that commitment and I had forgotten. The Lord said, you forgot, but I didn't. And there was that lifting. See, and, and I began to pray concerning gifts, ministries. I began to pray. There was something, and I almost felt guilty. But I was quickened by the Lord to pray. I had not even remotely a concept. Well, I just want to back up a little bit. See, I had that drive in me, an office on Main Street. I ended up owning two businesses. I owned a general insurance agency, one of the major agencies in the city where I was, with a very nice office on Main Street. In another city, I ended up owning a TV cable system with a store, with a franchise, a fully equipped store, very nice office on Main Street. The cable system was like owning a public utility. The insurance business, it was a general agency. It was very successful. Mm. The thing that I had intensely, I mean, I agonized in the Army, f the frustration and the feeling of this knowing the 98% thing. I knew all that and the frustration of never having an, an opportunity in life. And it was intense. And here I am owning a TV cable system and a general insurance agency and the money just flowing. Had I stayed there and the Lord didn't wreck the businesses, which, you know, well, you don't know. But I sold them when he dealt with me. I sold them. If I hadn't, he could have let me go my own way or he could have wrecked them. And I would have come anyway. But, it, but that I don't know because I, I sold them. But I owned these businesses. The money was flowing. I would have been a millionaire today several times over had I stayed and the Lord didn't meddle. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, <clears throat> but see, that intensity, I had it. And you know what I had? I, re I, I sat there with all of this that I had, so it was so intense within me, I couldn't explain to you how intense it was, the frustration of what had happened to me. And here I am with all this, and it was nothing. And I can look at where I am now, having none of that, but the satisfaction of what I know in God, what I can share, see, of the birds that come to lodge in the branches, see. Glory, hallelujah. See, there's a satisfaction that this world, you have no, I mean, this, it's intense because I lived it. See, I, it, it's, I, there is an intensity of that within me, experientially, that is intense, the satisfaction. Because I was there, I had it. The Lord, I, I, I could tell you the story on how I got those businesses. It is absolutely profound the way I felt it. Uh, the insurance business. 
I just thought it'd be nice, but I thought I have to work for somebody and learn the business. And I thought if I do, they'll be upset when I start my own business. I thought I'll, I'll find somebody that's real old, and then when they go off the scene, I can I can do my own thing. And so I found an agency, a very successful agency, where the man was 82 years old. So I go in the office and I said to the girl, I'd like to, you know, work here. I want to see Mr. Shannon, that was his name. She said, well, he's very old and he doesn't come in. So I said, can I go to his house, a beautiful home? Knocked on the door, started to talk to him. Before I left, he said, I have no children. He said, I own the building and it's got, I think it was five stores and 17 apartments. He said, I need somebody to kind of represent me. He said, I'll make, he said, I'll tell you what. He says, I'll give the business to you. Oh, no. <laughs> and he says, you'll need power of attorney. He says, and I had never seen him. He says, he says, I like you. He says, I don't know why he said that. He says, I'll give you power of attorney. You can start and sign policy. He says, as of now, the business is yours. I went back to the office and said to the girl, guess what? You're work you are working for me. <laughs> and here I am with an office on Main Street, my dream. I mean, I, mean, I don't know if things like that still happen. <laughs> but, I mean, it happened. See, the Lord dealt with that thing. And when I had it, I found out I didn't have anything. So then covet earnestly, see, that which is of God, the higher, that which will bring an eternal satisfaction. The word says go after it, ministry. But it begins on the herb level. It begins as a grain of mustard seed, insignificant. You have to know that. But if you'll nurture it, if you're careful with it, it'll begin to grow. It'll begin to develop. It'll become... See, it'll become, and you'll get ground, you'll get pulverized, you'll get rejected, told to sit down and be quiet. You know, all those nice, polite things will happen to you. That's all right. You're getting formed and getting reduced, and the pride and all those things are getting dealt with. But if you'll stick with it, and you may end up with some of Jethro's sheep, but that's all right. Be faithful, you know. They're not, they're not very good looking either. <laughs> because they're out in the desert. But that's all right. Just be, just be faithful. And at some point, the Lord all at once is going to appear. And your shoes go, and his shoes will... Whew, glory. Mm. See? Just be faithful. You'll be amazed at what will happen. Covet. How do you get it? You covet. Now, Ephesians chapter 4. <coughs> He gave. Ministry is a gift. See, that's why you can ask. You can go after it. It's going to cost you something, but that's all right. It's worth it. He gave. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I'm using a king. It says perfecting. That perfecting means to be properly equipped. That's all it means. To be pro a one-year-old child that falls down, takes three steps, falls down, is, is perfect because it's doing what a one-year-old child ought to do. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So then, the real bird in the ministry is not in the pulpit. The purpose of the pulpit is to equip the body for what? The work of the ministry. And somehow we get the idea that we hire a pastor, pay him a salary, and judge how well he does. Well, that means the whole, the whole congregation is expendable and the Lord's got one. <laughs> See, the fivefold is to equip the body for the work of ministry. Then the fivefold gets out of the way. To equip the body for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. These comments don't belong. They were added in the 1400s. Until we come, that means that this ministry is temporary. Because the, real, the goal is the functioning of the body. Now, these, these ministries, and I'm not going to take time with it right now, but these ministries are in, are in Romans 12, and, and there's other places in the Scripture. There's a reflection of the fivefold in the body. In other words, there are apostles that are called to the pulpit, but there are apostolic anointings in the body. If I'm called to mop floors, I can mop floors with an apostolic anointing. When I was in school... The, there, were, there were teachers. It was an unusual situation. There were five teachers uniquely set in by God. But there was, an elder, <clears throat> there was an elderly German lady that spoke very broken English. She was the matron. She had a desk down in the basement at the bottom of the stairs with mops around it. 
Walter Butler, I mentioned, there's nobody alive that could walk in a shoot, but you couldn't talk to him because he walked with God. And he was not a people person. You couldn't, you couldn't reach him, you couldn't get to him. And you, you received tremendously from his life and ministry, but you could not relate to him or talk to him. You could not go to him with a problem. He wouldn't talk to you. He didn't talk to anyone. There were others. But, but when you had a problem, you went to the matron. There was a major visitation in the school. I mean major. Two weeks of, the, of, of, of a fountain. I mean a fountain of new wine that was, that was 100 proof. Like we have today is about 10 proof. This was potent and powerful. A fountain literally. There was a visible, visible moving of, of glory. I mean visible for two weeks. Do you, you know who sat on the platform? Not Walter Butler, not the teachers, the matron. They put her on the platform. The whole, the whole thing was led from the body. None of that visitation began nor ended in the pulpit. It began in the body and it ended. And the person that sat on the platform was the matron that gave direction, guidance. When the students had a problem, they went to the, the matron. There are apostolic anointings, there are prophetic anointings, there are evangelistic anointings, pastoral anointings, and teaching anointings within the body that are to function. And the fivefold is to get these operating and then make room and let them operate. And that's what I've been saying yesterday, see. The emphasis is moving from the pulpit into the body because the head's taking its place and the body's to function. <clears throat> One of the reasons the book of Revelation is not understood because we look at Re Revelation as being the revelation of a five foot eight Jesus. It's not. It's the revelation of a corporate Jesus. The lamb in the book of Revelation is not Jesus. It's the, corp it's the head and body having been brought together. See, we're born of his bone flesh. It's the corporate. And it's the body functioning under the guidance of the head. All brought together. And so these ministries are given until... And the emphasis now is shifting from the pulpit to the body. I mentioned yesterday about the deeds of the, the Lord said he hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Ephesus, you've lost your first love, that is. You've lost that place where you function. Now I gave you a verse, and I'm going to read it once more, and then we're, then we're going to finish. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You need to remember that the early church, church at Ephesus, you've left your first love. The church at Ephesus didn't have a Bible, it wasn't even written yet. Much of it was not even written. And even if they had a Bible, they couldn't read nor write. The common people, the church was made up of common people, they could neither read nor write. And if they had a Bible, and the Bible wasn't yet written, so what did they? It was prophetic, and it moved in the body. So then, here's the word. How is it then, brethren? It's 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The word brethren is generic, it means all of us. How is it then, brethren, when you're come together? What's the next few words say? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. When you come together, what's the next part? Every one of you. Every one of you hath. And we'll talk about this some tomorrow. Not every one of you saith or doeth. See, if what I have, every one hath. See, that, that's the fivefold ministry, the reflection of the fivefold, the ministries within the body dispersed, covered earnestly, the gifts, the ministries, these ministries where they're functioning to the building up of the body. Every one of you hath the psalm, a hymn, a doctrine, a tongue, a revelation, because interpretation, see, these things have to come because they had no Bible. It, it was all done through, the, through prophetic revelation, a body quickened. Well, the Nicolaitan clergy came in, took over, reduced people to becoming spectators. They said, we'll hear from God, we'll speak, we'll hear, you just sit and listen. And the church died and the result was the Dark Ages. Now that's being corrected. We're in, we're in the final stage, the apostolic, which is an intensification. 
the Lord's moving an apostolic, and he's not going to raise up a new breed of apostles, the, the apostolic, but he's, he's going to begin to impart an apostolic anointing in the body. So if my calling is to mop floors, I'll mop floors with an apostolic anointing and authority. See, it'll move in every level, and, and it'll function in the body in every level. That, that's that end-time anointing that will bring the body into, into open view, bring it together into open view. And it's that apost and the anointing is not is going to come upon in the body, and and it'll it'll function and flow there. And so the Lord is preparing us for that. Have you, have you ever heard? There's only supposed to be three manifestations of the Spirit. Yeah, some of you probably heard some. That's a lot of, in Pentecostal churches. They say there's only supposed to be three manifestations. Let them speak two or the most three. You know, in a service. That's not what it says. What that means is this, any one person should only move out two or three times so that everybody can prophesy, everybody can speak. See, any one person should only move two or three times to make room for others so everybody can move out prophetically. It's not that there's only three manifestations in a service, but any one person, if you read it, that's exactly what it says. Any one person should only move two or three times to make room for everybody. So, so some churches actually appoint an official prophet. Well, that church is, is dying, and, and it will die, continue to die, because the word is, ye may what? All prophesied. Marilyn, you put your, you, were you just rejoicing, or? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you may all prophesy, one by one. That's the prophetic moving. See, that's the anointing that's being restored, an apostolic prophetic anointing. It's an end-time anointing where the body's going to be released in its full expression. And the Lord is doing a powerful work in this day. He's getting us ready. Amen. Amen. Glory. Okay. So our time.